Welcome to What's Really Happening in Southern Utah, the podcast. I'm your host, Dan Kidder. Our podcast is all about issues facing Southern Utah. Here we will announce your upcoming events, talk with movers and shakers in our community about important issues facing Beaver, Iron, Kane, and Washington counties, and make sure you are kept in the loop with interesting news and commentary of local interest. While we welcome folks from all over, our goal with this podcast is to give residents of Southern Utah a place to find out about issues that affect them. You can find us on Apple Podcasts and also on our Facebook group, What's Really Happening in Southern Utah, and online at whatsreallyhappeningsu.com. You're listening to What's Really Happening in Southern Utah, the podcast with your host, Dan Kidder. All right, folks, we are back in the studio today. We have the third part of our four-part series of candidate debates, and we had scheduled today to be a three-candidate debate. We uh, are working on School Board District 4 today, and so we had uh, scheduled this to be with uh, Mr. Dale Brinkerhoff and Ms. Stephanie Hill and uh, uh, Mary Foremaster. Unfortunately, Mary contacted me this morning to let me know that she is in the hospital and will not be able to attend. So I, I spoke with the other candidates who are here with me today in the studio, and I'm going to be bringing her in for a 45-minute solo interview uh, once she is recovered. But we do have Mr. Brinkerhoff, and we have Mrs. Hill with us here in the studio today. Welcome, and thank you for coming in. And thank you for the opportunity. Thanks, Dan. Great opportunity. Appreciate it. So this is for school district seat of district four. Um, so looking at when the ballots come out, you'll have two different uh, districts that you can vote on if you are in district four or district five. So I'm going to tell you both right up front. I'm not voting for either one of you. Um, I don't actually get to vote for anybody uh, running for school board because I'm in district three. So uh, sorry to tell you that I, you're not going to want to vote here today. Um, that's just the, the way the ball bounces. I think I get to vote next year or the next election cycle for uh, school district. So we have got some interesting questions here, and some of these questions came from uh, uh, members of the community. Uh, some of them I worked on. I actually have a background in education many, many moons ago. And uh, so I uh, provided some of these uh, questions, and they are specific to the education situation of what's going on in Iron County, in the state, and in the country. So Mrs. Hill has won the coin toss. She uh, got li Lady Liberty, and she has opted to go first. So the way this will work is uh, you each will have three minutes to kind of introduce yourself, tell people why they should vote for you, where they can find out more information about your positions and your platforms. And uh, you'll each have the three minutes for that. When the timer runs out, I will turn off your mic so nobody can come back and accuse me of giving anybody preferential treatment. After that, we will ask a series of questions, and uh, the person that the question is asked will have two minutes to answer that question, and their opponent will have one minute for a rebuttal. At the end of those uh, individual questions, there will be one question that is asked of both of you, and you will each have two minutes to answer that question, and there will be no rebuttal on that. And then at the end of that, you will have two minutes for a closing statement. Are we all good? All right. I've got three minutes on the clock, and we're going to allow Mrs. Hill to start us off with an introduction. Great. Thanks, Dan. I appreciate the opportunity. I'm Stephanie Hill, and I was born in Cedar City, Utah, into a family that settled the area 150 years ago. Since that time, we've been farming and ranching in the area. My grandfather was Doug Clark. He was a county commissioner, uh, additionally an attorney. He uh, was the one, actually, one of the first to bring suit against the federal government um, in 1953, when his sheep herd was decimated by the nuclear fallout of the above ground testing in 1953 during the middle of those proceedings he died of a heart attack my mother is his youngest child she and my father married um, and moved to las vegas to raise their family i was raised in las vegas which at that time was essentially a satellite of southern utah in many ways it still is um, I graduated from high school. I went to BYU. I actually finished my undergraduate degree at SUU in English, um, studying secondary education and Spanish as well. I then returned to Las Vegas where I spent 24 of my 27 years 
teaching at a nationally recognized technologies high school. I taught English and Spanish. While I was there, I had the opportunity to write curriculum. I was on a number of curriculum adoption and book adoption committees. I graded English for the Nevada State Proficiency exams. During that time, I was able to receive my master's degree from UC Santa Barbara in Spanish. I received a, a leadership endorsement from SUU at that time. I was later awarded a Fulbright grant to teach English in rural northern Mexico. Um, I followed that up with teaching at the internationally recognized university, the Tech of Monterey. Shortly after that, I had my son uh, as a single mother. And at th uh, three years, he was diagnosed with severe autism. We spent the next 10 years, 11,000 uh, hours of therapy recovering him. I became an advocate for uh, special education and people with special needs. I spent a lot of time at the state legislature offering my uh, testimony and comment. Um, we were able to move some really important le legislation for some of the most vulnerable people in the state of Nevada. Four years ago, I retired. I moved my son with me to Cedar City to help my widower father. I'm his only surviving child um, while I've been here. I've been able to substitute teach. I've been on trust lands committees um, and um, accreditation committee. Um, I was only recently married. Um, and my husband has a very similar background to mine. We have um, a, a great passion for education and community involvement. Um, he is also from a ranching family. I, if you can't tell, my passion is literacy. Uh, I think it's the building block of everything that we do. And I appreciate the chance to introduce myself. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Brinkerhoff. Thank you for the opportunity, Dale Brinkerhoff. I am the incumbent running for a second term. I'm uh, actually a Kane County native, moved here in 1966, spent 33 years at the university in construction management. We dealt with planning, design, construction, operation, maintenance, engineering, and energy management. A very fun ride, a lot of good friends at SUU, and uh, pleased to see some some good projects that brought a good return to the university. My political career is, uh, I'm sorry to even say, <laughs> a 32-year career in politics. I've served in Orderville Town Council, Kane County Commission, four terms, Cedar City Council, two terms, Iron County Commission, and finally on the school board. Some of my better assignments were sitting on mental health and physical health on the five county board. I learned a great appreciation for special needs in people with physical disabilities as well as mental. It's a great service to me. Uh, it's been a good ride on the school board. I'm fully supportive of the faculty and staff administration of the school. We are on the right course, and if I'm elected, I will continue to follow that same course of action. I believe this, the faculty deserve all the respect and support and protection that we can give them, and I don't think we need a bunch of new programs or initiatives. Uh, that's about all the time I need today. All right. Thank you. Stop that timer. All right, we're ready to get into the questions. The first question is for Mrs. Hill. Mrs. Hill, more and more school boards are being mandated by state and federal law to include identity politics, such as transformative social and emotional learning, critical race theory, queer theory, and transgender theory into their curricula and policies. What do you believe is the role of a school board member when it comes to implementing these policies into our schools? You will have two minutes. Very good. Thanks for the question, Dan. Um, the, clearly, we live in divisive times. Um, the, the transgender policy, I was able to sit before the school board um, work meeting a couple of weeks ago as Dr. Hatch is trying to hammer out some kind of plan. One of my major concerns is that there's very little legal precedence on how we handle some of these policies in school. I, I believe that we have a solid bullying policy in place. I was rather um, disconcerned with part of the 
of some of the discussed policy um, not being forthcoming with parents should there be a bullying incident for their child to make sure, in fact, um, special care w was advised to um, to be taken to not advise parents. I'm absolutely opposed to that. We're going to have to get a solid gender policy in place. The the superintendent referenced federal law. In fact, I've been trying to investigate the federal law that would govern um, very specifically gender identity, and I'm, I, I can't find it. I think it's maybe coming out of Title VI, Title VII, potentially Title IX, but none of those deal with gender. These are, these are sex issues. I want to make very clear that every child comes to school, and we have an obligation to keep that child safe. But I want to make I want to make very sure that we fall within legal guidelines. I think we've also arrived at the place where we need to have legal counsel sitting in on the school board work meetings and then those public meetings. Um, clearly, this is something we're going to have to identify. I get rather disconcerned when all of our time and resources get swallowed up when, with these discussions when we literally have a third of our children at reading level. And again, I'm going to go right back to literacy. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Brinkerhoff. That's a very good question, one that I'm sure, I was very sure that would be on the, on the list today. The model policy that we're working on, that Ms. Hill reference to, is a policy in working. We're trying to marry in state school board as well as whatever state mandate is, along with federal guidelines of mainly Title IX. And we have a pretty good base to start on. It, it's not going to please everyone, but again, the, the school district's responsibility as a whole is to provide an educational opportunity for all students. And that means that we protect and defend all students as well. And it, it's quite a challenge to try and marry up everyone's concern. Uh, Am I out? You are out. Okay. All right. We're going to get to your first question. Mr. Brinkerhoff, more and more, we're seeing school districts seek to eliminate parental guidance and input in school policies and even going so far as reporting parents who oppose school boards to the U.S. Justice Department and the FBI as domestic terrorists for voicing their disapproval. We've seen parents arrested or removed from school board meetings. What do you believe is the proper role of parents in the educational environment? Well, certainly I believe that parents are an integral part of any discussion, any action, any policy, any procedure that comes out of the school. There is legal precedent that bars the district from disseminating some information and some of it is geared toward parents and I find that very, very objectionable. The things we're working on, but uh, I'm very concerned that it's an open book between uh, the district, the teachers, the counselors, as well as the students and the parents. I don't, I don't know how we have got so entwined in all this government interference in their lives and their policies. We don't need it in Iron County, and we're trying to be as clean and straight with, with parents and with, with everyone as, possible, as we possibly can be. Okay. Mrs. Hill. Very good, thank you. I can answer that question, Dale. The reason that we've got entwined is that we take federal money and we're accountable to them with their stipulations and their caveats. I would also remind all of our listeners um, that according to state statute, parents are deemed the primary teachers of their children. I'm infinitely grateful for Merrick Garland calling those of us who take that driver's seat in our child's education. I'm infinitely grateful that he would have called us domestic terrorists because that, in fact, has marshaled, it has marshaled the army of parents to get more involved. I was incredibly grateful um, during the last school board meeting when Dr. Hatch, um, dem when he highlighted the initiatives available for all to view um, it's actually under the uh, employees heading, but it's for anyone in the community and certainly parents who would want to view that. I am grateful for parental support and contribution. Okay. As am I. 
So the next question is for you, Mrs. Hill. Recently, we had a social studies teacher within Iron County who expressed on social media his wish that Republican lawmakers would be killed by rioters. This was in response to the events of January 6, 2021. Do you believe that teachers should have the freedom to express thoughts like this on social media where they are seen by their students, or should they be held to a higher standard of behavior? Great question. Thank you. Um, of course, teachers have the freedom to express their so thoughts on social media. They also have... <laughs> They also have the right to face the consequences that those thoughts are going to purport. Um, that I'm, a, I'm a little familiar with what came down, and he suggested physical violence um, against, uh, against those people. Um, that's a frightening, that's a, that is a frightening reality. And I was grateful for the swift action that Dr. Hatch took. I, um, I, I'm speechless. Um, of course, they can express their concerns, but in fact, teachers, there was a time when we held to a higher standard. I still think that's true, um, th and, and I hope I get the opportunity in a moment to read from statute um, regarding the, the qualities, in fact, once referred to as American ideals, that that teachers by statute are charged with teaching. This is honesty, integrity, kindness, um, any kind of inflammatory and um, inciting uh, comment with regard to the, 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 a, a political climate or action is absolutely unacceptable. Um, and I, I'm a bit familiar with the action that was taken by the school district, and I'm very grateful for it. There's a time and a place. Social media is, in fact, that. It's social. And in, in, a, in a very difficult way, the classroom continues on into social media, and it's certainly captured the attention of all of our students and um, influences everything that we all do. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Brinkerhoff. Well, there's no doubt that social media has really influenced and made a great impact on all of our lives. Uh, we, we, all people, remember when uh, such things didn't exist and we dealt with each other on a personal basis on a daily, on a daily routine, routine. We will always have certain people who tread a little on the outside of the lines, such as the case that is mentioned. And I don't condone that. I do support and, and, uh, and protect the faculty in trying to teach correct principles, teaching correct history, and the things that uh, we hold near and dear to our values as a country. But we do expect teachers to act professionally because they are professional, and that's why we hired them. So it it's a it's a requirement of everyone, including teachers, to... All right. Your time ran out, sir. That's, that's good. Oh, I didn't know that was a rebuttal. <laughs> that was a rebuttal. Yes, sir. Oh, I didn't mean it as such. All right. This question is for you. This is one of yours. Um, currently, Iron County students are approximately 50% proficient in academic subjects, according to RISE results. We're uh, seeing a desire from parents to increase this level of proficiency, what steps would you take to improve proficiency of students in academic metrics for reading, language arts, science, social studies, and math? By simply hiring good professional teachers in addition to those we already have, we have the programs in place. We have the, the, have the academic materials for them to teach. Uh, we just need to implement those things in the classroom and, and uh, we are grading. We're trying to improve those efficient, efficient those proficiencies, and the scores are rising. But we just need to improve on what we're already doing. We don't need some new initiatives or new programs. We have those in place already. Okay. Mrs. Hill. I love this question. This is almost essentially my entire platform. Um, in fact, in ELA, that number is 37%. There will be new test scores that will be 
published in the fall, but we've only got 37% of our fourth graders reading at grade l level. That's abysmal. Um, I'm sure that our listeners are not aware. In fact, we were only all made aware through the New York Times yesterday, Lucy Calkins, who's been a guru of, uh, le of reading instruction, has backtracked on her whole language approach, which in fact is the majority of the nation. And as I've had experience in this district, I can see a whole language approach being used. Discrete phonics has got to be taught in early, in, in early instruction. And if kids aren't learning to read, then we need to go back. In fact, I would, I would say that we need to relook at those programs and we need to take a look at the RISE test to see if we're testing the right things. Not enough time, thanks. Okay. Um, Mrs. Hill, this question's for you. Student bullying has been a real problem nationwide and has even resulted in a suicide at Cedar High. What specific actions would you take as a school board member to raise awareness of the harm bullying causes? And what corrective actions would you implement for those who engage in this behavior? Thank you for the question. It's, it is a reflection of a culture that is in crisis. I read lots of educational literature. It's been remarkable as, the, as society at large has been able to unmask and kids have actually been able to get back to school what has happened as a result of the opportunity to build community again. I think we've all heard this expression, hurt people hurt people. I think that's part of what's going on with bullying. I would actually go right back to um, our, our, our test scores, 37% of the kids only 37%. It's not much better. Even pre-COVID, it was 50%. When a kid sits in a class and attends school and is continuously failing within the major arena of his life, how else is he going to respond? We have got to reestablish a curriculum or curricula that work. Each teacher is given only two pages of a state standard. That's not enough to actually be able to perform well on a standardized test. I think if we can crowd out ugly, hurtful behavior with uh, more community opportunities and more opportunities to experience success, that's going to galvanize the student body. We, we have, you know, I, we've had a lot of reason for society to, to unravel and for traditions and for security to unravel. I, I, we need to get back to school and we need to make sure our kids are successful. We have a good bullying policy in place. I just wanna see it have to be used less. Um, again, I'm gonna go back, right back to the academics and supporting um, a solid culture, celebrating community. Thank you. I don't need a rebuttal. No rebuttal on that one? Okay. No. This next question is for you, Mr. Brinkerhoff. Currently, Utah uses RISE to measure student proficiency. Prior to RISE, Utah utilized SAGE for this purpose. Aside from state assessments, would you support localized assessments in Iron County? Well, I guess I'm not fully up to speed on it. I'd support anything that, that has to do with the testing of our students. Uh, I believe we have good curriculum. We have good teachers. We just need to get back to basics and, and teach what we already know. And, uh, and test and, I don't know, I'm, I'm a little at loss as to how to respond to that. But I'm, I'm all in for it. testing and raising our score levels. Okay. Mrs. Hill. Thank you very much. Um, both RISE and SAGE are state-developed tests. Um, th they are developed from, as I've already mentioned, essentially a two-page curriculum. This may be one of the most important things that I say today. You cannot get good results on standardized testing when you don't have standardized teaching. Each of our teachers is given a two-page standards document and then they're expected to have students perform um, on on highly specialized tests I am completely opposed to that what would I do here's what I would do 
we are by law mandated to teach those standards. In fact, right now we are revising standards for ELA and social studies. I would resurrect a much denser curriculum that would, real, that would align with those standards. Very good. Not enough time. This question is for you, Mrs. Hill. Currently, the majority of teachers in Iron County are nearing retirement age. What steps would you take as a school board member to retra retain and attract good teachers? And also, what steps would you take to correct or remove teachers who are underperforming? It's very difficult to remove a teacher who is underperforming. I remember um, over several years, um, having to go through a book study with poor teachers who um, Doug Lemov's um, book, and there were 63, I believe 63 um, practices, strategies for, for good teaching. And I remember doing a book study for the better part of a year and some of those poor teachers were still poor. It's very difficult to get them um, out or trained actually. As far as being able to hire good teachers, I am not aware of the partnership that the Iron County School District has with the, the College of Education over at SUU. Whatever it is, we can deepen that. I can remember when I went through my teacher education program, I clearly had a lot of practice in the classroom. But I was absolutely hungry, especially as an English teacher. I only had one, I only had one class that actually taught me how to teach writing. Well, that's in fact what you do when you go into the English classroom. You marry a stack of papers. I would have loved the opportunity as a student to go into those classrooms to, to, to have teachers have modeled for me what the classroom looked like. I am firmly convinced that we can deepen that connection literally less than a mile away. Um, we have a gold mine opportunity with the university. Of course, I'm, uh, I, have, I, I really like the university and I'd love to see that relationship um, develop. Anyway, thank you. Mr. Brinkerhoff. We do have a good relationship with SUU and it's a very fortunate thing for the district. Uh, the best way we get good teachers is to increase the salary so we can attract good teachers, require professionalism, and uh, train them and treat them well to stay. And the follow-up was, yes, it's difficult to get rid of a, a bad teacher. And sometimes a bad teacher is not always bad. There's different methods of review and evaluation. Sometimes marginal teachers can uh, can be helped and trained and uh, encouraged and made uh, good effective teachers in the classroom okay next question is for you mr brinkerhoff recently a charter school with multiple campuses in the state was denied per permission by the state school board to open a campus in cedar city what is your position on school choice for students and parents in Iron County? I'm a big supporter of school choice. The question that you pose ask for the school board's uh, authorization or, uh, or encouragement. I'm not getting the right words. My comment was to vote for no opposition, not for support nor non-support. Uh, I'd welcome them to come, but I don't want them to come with any strings attached to SUU, excuse me, to ICSD that would turn into a financial or any other kind of a, a situation where, we'd, where we would have to support, maybe physically or not physically, but monetarily. So that's my position. Okay. Mrs. Hill. This is fascinating. I want to dig in to see who this was, so I'm going to have to talk with you about this later. Dan, the state school board, there is a state school board, but there's also a state charter board, so I'm wondering where the denial came from. Um, this, you're not, this is not the typical answer from someone who lived and died on the public school hill, but I am all for uh, the money following the backpack. I love that idea. I think... Um, 
competition breeds excellence. And if our public schools are forced to up their game, I know we will. I know we will. Um, and I think everyone, everyone wins in the process. I love charters. I think homeschooling um, is, a, is a wonderful option for those parents. Um, I, I like competition. I'm a, I'm a good old American. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So this question is for both of you. You will each have two minutes, and uh, there will be no rebuttal. And since Mrs. Hill, you started off, I'm going to let Mr. Brinkerhoff go first on this one. Uh, currently, the statewide student-to-teacher ratio is 16 to 1. In Iron County, the average ratio is 22 to 1. And in some schools, is nearly 30 to 1. What steps would you support to reduce the student-to-teacher ratios in Iron County? Well, we have several problems. Number one is the space availability for expanding of classrooms. The other thing is being able to hire good teachers to staff those classrooms. We have made significant gains in teacher salaries in the last two years, and that's helped and will continue to help. But we're in a position that we don't have a lot of space that we could add more classrooms if we had the, the teaching support to take care of them and we're working on that. That's part of the bond proposal that we'll be coming forth in uh, two years with when their other debt service is paid down. So it's a, it's a two-pronged thing, space and teacher availability, and we'll provide those as we, as we can as we move forward. Okay. Mrs. Hill. Very good. Thank you. Uh, we got to have more space. We certainly have to have more space. Um, we're thinking about tearing down a school. We need to be building a school. We've had a ton of growth in the valley. We're going to get a ton more growth in the valley, and we need to we need to create some more space. Those classrooms are big. You know, I, I'm looking at that having come from Clark County. Uh, oftentimes, 30 to one was the threshold. I I taught classes with 37 to one. You're not doing a whole lot of teaching, I'll be perfectly honest with you. And in the younger classes, it needs to be much lower. Um, when It shouldn't be more than about probably 15 in first grade, not more than 18, 17, 18 in second and third. Um, we've got to build more schools. Uh, clearly, this is an issue of money, and Iron County has become more competitive. That's a challenge. Um, we're the second poorest county in the state, and I'm not sure, you know, I just sat in on um, the sheriff talking about what he's able to pay his his deputies, and it's it's disheartening at best. With that in mind, I think we're going to have a very difficult time justifying tearing down classroom space, and we're going to have to find some money to build some more. Um, I think we can rebond within a couple of years. But we've got to see what we can do about bumping up teacher benefits or salaries. And clearly, we, we, need, we need more space. We need more classroom space. These are not easy solutions. Thank you. OK. Mr. Brinkerhoff. I don't have rebuttal. She's correct. Well, <laughs> you agree with her? Yeah. All right. <laughs> what she said. All right. Um, Mrs. Hill, you uh, will have two minutes to uh, give a final statement and make sure you let everybody know where they can uh, find out more information about you or how they can contact you uh, and uh, all that good, fun stuff. Oh, let me start that timer over. It is good, fun stuff. I want to thank you again, Dan, and I want to thank the listeners. I'm going to go right back to... I'm going to go right back to literacy. Um, this was really a bombshell in the New York Times. It's not a bombshell for those of us who understand literacy. My son, uh, as I've already mentioned, it took us 11,000 hours of therapy to get him language, and we still keep pulling it. What I didn't mention is that I paid almost $18,000 to get him 160 hours of specialized reading, reading training um, through Linda Mood Bell, uh, it, truly the Cadillac of services. And I'm going to tell you right now, you've got to have discrete phonics. And then you have to have guided um, think-alouds with reading. Um, we do need to change our reading program. I just think it's pretty remarkable that um, 
that Lucy Calkins, who's made tens of millions of dollars, is finally realizing this, we go right back to reading. It is the single factor that bridges the socioeconomic gap. It's the single factor. Everything else that we do with kids will fall into place. Well, that's a joke, not really, but, but we're going to solve the majority of our academic issues if we can get these kids to read. One of my platform issues is access. I've already mentioned that Dr. Hatch has a comprehensive list of initiatives. With that, we can drill down in on programs. I think I've already mentioned that with the two-page standards that sort of set us up for standardized testing failure, I would like to resurrect old curricula and have teachers input to make sure that our kids can be successful. Please contact me. Um, hill for school at gmail.com uh, it's the same hill for school.com if you'd like to read my platform i'm very happy to speak with any of you thank you thank you mr brinkerhoff and thanks again for the opportunity this is a this is a good public forum and it, it's great for all of us to be involved in it i would simply say that I intend to follow this, the same course that I've been on for the last three and a half years, so I don't expect any new great and wonderful programs. I need to take a quick opportunity to thank Kent Peterson, who was administrator, the business administrator for 45 years. He's the one that kept this district in black solvent space over the many years of, of lean years. So we owe him a great debt of thanks. Uh, we have a new administrator, Todd Hess, and our new superintendent is Lance Hatch, as everyone knows. When he interviewed, he said, I wouldn't expect to come here as a, as a show pony, but as a work horse. And he's, he's documented and, and uh, performed that to the utmost. He's, uh, he's very efficient, very concerned about public attitudes and, and public input. I uh, have a lot of respect and admiration for both of those gentlemen as well as the other directors on the, in the administration. I'm, I'm pleased to be there, but my contact is simply dalebrinkerhoff at gmail.com. Be happy to respond to anyone. Phone number is 435-559-1852. And thanks again for the opportunity. Thank you both for being here. It's no fun to put yourself in the hot spot. It can be a, a little daunting. Um, and we want to also send out our best wishes to Mary Foremaster, who could not be here today. She ended up being in the hospital. She had agreed to attend and, and participate. And so we're going to, again, have her come back into the studio uh, once she's recovered and, and do a solo interview where we can ask her some of these same questions. Uh, both of you, best of luck to you. And uh, I, I want to say, give a little opinion here. You know, putting yourself in this position is rough. It, it's, it's not fun. I've been in your shoes many, many, many times over the years. Um, so either of these candidates who align with your values and your beliefs are deserving of your vote. So check out their positions and share this with anyone else, because I don't think there's any subject within our community that's more important than education. We have... Uh, future generations who are going to have to take care of us when we're uh, up there in a couple more years for me, I think. Um, so uh, this this topic is extremely important. It affects property taxes. It affects so much that goes on in our community. And we are expanding the school board uh, from five to seven. And so that is happening uh, as we speak and this will be the first year going forward that we have seven districts uh, in Iron County. And so we have a couple of more candidates who are running unopposed. And then tomorrow we will have in the studio Mr. Billy Davis and Mr. Steve Merrill, who are running for District 5. Miss Tiffany Christiansen uh, declined to participate, quote, because things could be taken out of context. So you can do with that what you will. But we will have uh, those two gentlemen in here tomorrow running for District 5. And we really appreciate everybody checking in and listening and ask you to share this podcast. And you all have a great day. Thank you for listening to What's Really Happening in Southern Utah, the podcast. 
We hope that you found this content to be worthwhile. We want to hear from you. So if you have any upcoming event that you'd like to share with our listeners, or if you represent a local group, we'd love to have you come into the studio. Just email us at contact at what's really happening su.com. We're also working on streaming this podcast live and have the ability for folks to call in and ask questions or share items of interest to residents of Southern Utah. Be sure to share this podcast with your friends. And again, thanks for listening.